Welcome to the worship service of Glen Burnie United Church. I'm Reverend Elizabeth Bohm Wilson, the minister who has the pleasure of serving here. We're so glad that you could join us for worship today on this, the second Sunday in the season of Lent. gather for worship to load up with provisions for our journey. Provisions like encouragement, embrace, forgiveness, and grace. We gather for worship as a little oasis on this journey, as we move from the wilderness toward the cross, following Jesus, learning from his teaching, feeling his welcome and his love, gaining wisdom and courage from his example. We gather for worship together to be present to God's presence. Let us pray. We turn to you, O God, trusting in your love and forgiveness, trusting you to guide us on this journey through dusty deserts to living water, from death to new life. Bless our journey in this Lenten season, that we may draw ever closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a while, a whole year in fact, since any of you children sat inside the sanctuary for a worship service. So maybe your memory of this space in there is getting a little fuzzy. So I have a question for you to test your memory. When you are sitting in there for worship, what is front and center in your view? Do you remember? What is right at the front 
and right in the center. The cross. Here's another question. If you are outside of our church and you look at the highest point of our building, what's there? Another cross. How many crosses do you think there are in our church? There are two crosses on the pulpit where I preach from in the wood. And then there's a third cross on that purple banner that's hanging on the, on the pulpit. There is a cross right in the front and center of our communion table. It's a kind of a different shape cross, but it, there, that's a cross. And then on the tablecloth that runs across the communion table, there's a cross at each end. And then do you see those stands um, there's two of them, but I don't know if you can see one because it's kind of hidden behind the baptismal font. But there's two stands, and right now the, the offering plates are sitting on top of them. But sometimes we've had plants on those or flowers at Easter time, different things. And if you notice, the legs of those stands are shaped like very tall crosses. And there's four legs on each of those stands, so that's eight crosses right there. There are, there's a cross on top of the baptismal font. It's just a little cross. The handle of the, of the lid is a cross. And there is a little cross of every hymn book in our church. And there are too many hymn books here for me to count. So that's um, a lot of crosses right here in the sanctuary. And perhaps I'm missing some, but that's how many I could find. Then I looked around the church building to see if there were more. And I found all of these. Do you have any crosses in your home? Maybe some of you still have those string art crosses that we made at Messy Church a couple years ago. Remember those? We had a lot of fun that night making those. I have a few crosses at home. Crosses that hang on the walls, a cross that fits in the palm of my hand, even cross jewelry. If you have a cross at home, I'd love to see a picture of it. Maybe you would take a picture and send it to me. What do you know about the cross? Why do you suppose churches and Christians like to have the image of the cross in so many places? Well, Jesus died on a cross, and we are followers of Jesus. But that still doesn't explain why we would want a cross around. You would think it would be sad to have a reminder of the way Jesus died. But that's just it. The cross does remind us that Jesus died, but it also reminds us that Jesus lives, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And because of that, the cross can be a reminder that God is able to bring new life out of death, that God is able to bring joy even out of pain. The cross reminds us that death is not our end. Life with God is our end. Also, the cross reminds us of God's love and forgiveness. When Jesus was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. He was praying for the people who were killing him, that God would forgive them. That's what God's love is like. It's always willing to forgive. God's love brings goodness and life, even out of the worst things that can happen in our lives. Some churches have a tradition on Easter of covering their crosses in flowers. It's a beautiful way of saying that we trust God to bring beauty and joy, to bring new life, even out of death. And that's why 
the cross has a place in all our churches. It's why it hangs front and center. It's why some of us wear crosses as jewelry. I saw a piece of artwork recently that a church made together. Every person in the church made a small cross out of two popsicle sticks. And then all those small crosses were put together to make a bigger cross that hung in their church. Do you think we could do this? Do you think you could find two popsicle sticks hanging around your house and make a cross out of it? Maybe you'll have to go out and buy a popsicle to do it, but I think we could all make a popsicle stick cross, decorate it with paint or marker or even just pencil, make it unique, and then I want you to send your crosses to me. And then I'll put them all together and hopefully by Easter, we can have a big cross that we made all together.
Who knows us better than God? God loves us even when we fail. God seeks us when we would try and hide. God yearns to draw us close. So come, let us turn to God in a silent prayer of confession. Hear this good news. The God we seek is also seeking us, loves and forgives us, and always offers us a chance to begin again. This is the peace of Christ with you and for you. Our first scripture reading today is from Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, I, and I will make you my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you, you shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come for you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you, and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Reading from Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is trans no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are, were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became father of many nations just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord 
from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. lesson this morning is taken from Mark 8 verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked his disciples who do people say that I am and they answered him John the Baptist and others Elijah and still others one of the prophets. He asked them but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great sufferings and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, 
and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of life, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be pleasing in your sight. And may it lead us to a deeper understanding of you and the love you call us to live. Amen. I want to begin with a poem, a poem that reads more like a story. It's written by the contemporary theologian Brian McLaren. It doesn't have a title. Please de-baptize me, she said. The priest's face crumpled. My parents tell me you did it, she said. But I was not consulted, so now undo it. The priest's eyes asked why. If it were just about belonging to this religion and being forgiven, then I would stay. If it were just about believing this list of doctrines and upholding this list of rituals, I'd be okay. But your sermon on Sunday made it clear that it's about more, more than I bargained for. So please, de-baptize me. The priest looked down, said nothing. She continued, you said baptism sends me out into the world to love enemies. I don't, nor do I plan to. You said it means being willing to stand against the flow. I like the flow. You described it like rethinking everything, like joining a movement. But I'm not rethinking or moving anywhere, so unbaptize me, please. The priest began to weep. Soon great sobs rose from his deepest heart. He took off his glasses, blew his nose, took three tissues to dry his eyes. These are tears of joy, he said. I think you are the first person who ever truly listened and understood. So, she said, will you, please? The poem is a little misleading because when parents present their child for baptism, they do, do not make vows that the child has to keep. They make vows that they themselves must keep. Their, the parents promise to follow the way of Christ in their private and public life and to share in the life, work, and ministry of Jesus Christ. These are the same promises that adult individuals make when they choose to become members of the church. Parents bringing their children for baptism make one more promise, and that is to share their faith with their child and to provide opportunities for their children to grow in faith. But the point of the poem is a good one. Being a Christian is not just about belonging to a religion and being forgiven. It's not just about believing a list of doctrines or upholding certain rituals. It is more. Making a commitment to follow the way of Christ sends us out into the world to love neighbors and enemies, to stand against the flow, to join a movement, a movement we call the kingdom or the reign of God. Being a Christian is a commitment to a way of life that has always been and still is countercultural and challenging. We heard a little bit of a very foundational faith story this morning, that of Abram and Sarai's call to follow God. They were asked to leave their home and to leave behind any personal plans they may have made for themselves in that place, to start out new to go to a destination that remained unclear until they got there. It was a long journey, 
through wilderness, complete with experiences of hunger, fear, doubt, and waiting. Lots of waiting. Abram and Sarai were elderly already at the start of the journey, and many years went by before they saw any fulfillment of God's promise to them. It's a good reminder to all of us that there's no retirement age for the Christian calling. Their journey, their calling, was challenging to say the least. I don't know how anyone gets the idea that the way of Christ looks like the road to success, to the road to comforts and prosperity. And yet, I have heard it preached that way. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus told his disciples what lay ahead for him, rejection, suffering, and death. Peter was terribly taken aback by this idea. That was not the journey he thought he was on. He took Jesus aside to reason with him, to propose a better way, an alternative way, a way without suffering. But Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. The word Satan means accuser or the adversary. In trying to steer Jesus to a way other than God had called him, other than the one God had called him to, Peter was being an adversary. Jesus said, you are setting your mind on human things rather than divine things. It's not that Jesus sought rejection, suffering, and crucifixion. He merely predicted it. He knew that the values of the kingdom of God were not compatible with the values of the empire. Peter wanted Jesus to compromise his values if it meant staying alive and staying safe, but Jesus would not. Jesus tells his followers what lays ahead for him, and then he says, if any of you want to become my followers, you must deny yourself. Jesus is not suggesting that we, as his followers, should deny ourselves all pleasure and satisfaction. This is, after all, the same Jesus who turned water into wine at a wedding party, who delighted to dine with friends and strangers, who offered living water that could quench one's thirst and the bread of life to fill us. Jesus is not recommending denial for denial's sake, but denial for another's sake, otherwise known as sharing or equanimity. It is denying our priority. This is one of the values of the kingdom. God has provided living water and the bread of life, the wine of gladness and the fruits of the earth for all of us to share. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross. What's worse than hearing Jesus say that there is a cross in his future? Hearing him say that there's a cross that belongs to us. <laughs> take up your cross. For us today, the cross is a symbol and it's a largely positive one. It has come to represent God's love as it was revealed in Jesus. It is a reminder that in Jesus' death and resurrection, God overcame the forces of death and evil. So there is a promise of life beyond death. But for the people Jesus was addressing in today's gospel lesson, people who lived on the other side of the resurrection story, the cross had no positive connotations. In first century Palestine, the Romans used the cross to threaten people into submission. It was a punishment inflicted on those whom the Roman Empire perceived as a threat. Death on a cross was a slow and agonizing way to die, and it was done as a public display 
so as to deter others from rebelling. The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived and wrote about the first century, tells of thousands of crucifixions in the area around Jerusalem. The cross was an image that struck fear into the hearts of Jesus' listeners. To them, Jesus says, take up your cross. Take up that thing which is meant to keep you submissive to abusive power. Take up that which causes you to cower in fear and heave it up on your shoulder and follow me. Follow Jesus as he brings good news to the poor, sight to the blind, inclusion to the ostracized, freedom to the captive, liberation to those who are oppressed. Jesus is not asking his followers to seek out crosses to bear, to seek suffering for suffering's sake. He is urging them to not let their fears of punishment or suffering or death prevent them from living out the values of God's kingdom. The reality of the people Jesus was speaking to is a world away from our own in 21st century North America. Even so, we may, we may be able to imagine being in their shoes. We have never had to fear violent repercussions for living out our faith, but maybe we can imagine how they felt because we do have a little experience with lesser fears. The fear of becoming unpopular, the fear of seeming too religious, the fear of making waves, the fear of making people we care about uncomfortable, the fear of upsetting the status quo, the fear of losing a little of our own privilege. Even these small fears have sometimes kept us from doing what is right. We may have kept quiet in the face of racism or sexism or classism, in the face of homophobia or xenophobia or malicious gossip. Perhaps we have failed to stand up for the bullied, failed to welcome the stranger or the refugee. We may have turned a blind eye to injustice or to environmental degradation. We have at times failed to love as Jesus loves. We have failed to live out the values of God's kingdom, even though we have it easy, relatively speaking. We can advocate for the unjustly imprisoned around the world through organizations like Amnesty International without any fear of reprisal. We are able to help the poor and share resources as easily as reaching into our pockets and making a donation. We can advocate for justice by writing letters or signing petitions and by voting. These things require so little of us, only a little of our time, a little of our wealth, a little sacrifice of our privilege, perhaps, a little compassion, a little courage sometimes. And still, we need to be called forth to do so. Jesus said, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who will lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Jesus calls us to service, to follow him, to live out the values of the kingdom of God, the dream of God. To do that, we have to deny ourselves. That is, we have to stop living as if our lives and the lives of our families have greater value than other lives. To do that, we have to get past our fears. We have to pick up our cross and walk on following Jesus as he leads us into ever wider circles of community 
new places, new callings, new ways to serve, then we will have life, abundant life. Throughout the six weeks of Lent, our congregation is taking up a special offering on top of our regular givings in order to support the United Church mission and service. With that in mind, over the next four weeks, we will be showing brief video clips which highlight some of the projects that are supported with our donations to mission and service. Everyone needs to know that somebody believes in them. The mission and service of the United Church of Canada lets people like Arwa Nofel know that you believe that they can change their lives for the better. My name is Arwa Nofel. Uh, I am from Palestine. Um, I am a mother of three beautiful children. I came here in summer uh, 2017 to Canada. It wasn't easy uh, for me at all as a single mom with the three kids in a new country, new culture, and new people. I was struggling. The whole family got involved to uh, Montreal City Mission with uh, all activities and the projects they provided. Through Montreal City Mission, Arwa began a women's catering cooperative. It was uh, pretty good for me and for other women, other uh, refugee and newcomer women. It, it went uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, until the pandemic hit. Arwa and her friends began sewing face masks for homeless shelters and frontline workers. The six women were soon producing more than 500 masks per week. I would like to thank Mission and Service of uh, United Church of Canada. Three years ago, I was just, uh, just a refugee woman who was in need, and now uh, I am a coordinator uh, of uh, so many activities uh, at Montreal City Mission. Actually, I consider myself a lucky person. I hope to see more and more women getting that chance to have this better life for their families. We offer all our gifts to God in gratitude. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless our gifts, the work of our hands, 
the love of our hearts, the fruit of our labors. Bless them and use them for your purposes, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us spend some time together in prayer. We come before God with all that we are, our brokenness and our giftedness, our aspirations and our failures. And God meets us and listens in love. Let us pray. In this time of prayer, we call to mind all that worries us in this moment all those things that keep us up at night. And we hold it before God, knowing that God will hold all of it, even as God holds us. We call to mind all that comforts us, all the things and people and places that bring us joy or pleasure. And we hold all of this before God, with gratitude. We call to mind all those we know who are ill and all who are struggling with pain or disability. We hold them in our hearts, longing for their well-being. We hold them in the light of God's love. We call to mind all those who are serving God by serving others, healthcare workers, those who care for the poor and the homeless, those who work for justice, those who care for the earth. We hold them in our hearts with gratitude and admiration, asking that God would bless them with wisdom, strength, and courage. We call to mind all those who suffer because of injustice, those who live in poverty or under oppression, those who live without freedom, who suffer abuse, who are denied dignity and equality. We grieve the injustices of our world and we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that God's will be done in our own lives, in our relationships, our households, in our actions. We pray that we would be willing to work for the peace and justice that we long for. God, give us courage to walk in your way and live your love. We bring all these prayers to God, who bends low in love to hear us, who reaches out to guide us, who holds us in his hands, who holds the whole world in her love. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his friends, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. who walks with wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out our hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open our hearts to love. And as we go into this week, may we see the face of Christ in everyone we meet. And may everyone we meet see the face of Christ in us. Go now in peace, never be afraid, God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong and true, no God will guide. Go now in peace, in faith.